Hi, and welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Petro Refix. And on this week's episode, we've got another Commodore 64 with a black screen. This one's been sent in from Michael uh, from Ireland. Um, he messaged me over Facebook um, after watching me repair Phil's video. Um, this one's got a black screen. He wasn't too confident about desoldering the board um, to remove the chips, because most of them were soldered on. Uh, they were only sort of the kernel and your basic ones, you know, like your, your CPU, PLA, SID, all the rest of them were soldered to the board. So we're going to dig into this now and we'll uh, see what we can find with it. Let's get on. And on this week's video, we've got another Commodore 64, which had a black screen. Um, Michael sent me this in after watching me repair Phil's Commodore 64 on the previous video. He liked what I did on the video. He likes the fact that he can watch me repair and see how things have gone. Um, this video is going to be a little bit different. Um, it has sent me around the houses. I've spent quite a lot of time on it, trying to find out where it is. I, I'm, I always do like to stick to the layman's terms, uh, ways, or laywoman's, whichever way around you want to look at it. Um, as for you guys out there, I haven't got the likes of oscilloscopes, etc. and stuff like that. And I, I try to leave the oscilloscope until last, if I possibly can, which I've done on this one. So as you can see at the moment, we're sat there running away with the dead test cartridge and the harness on. It's now passed, and it's passing all flying colours. So what I did at first is he had one of these gals. Well, you can see that on camera. I'll try and focus on that if I can. Can't see it on the card, can you? He had one of these gal chips. I'll put a picture up. I had a gal chip in there, which sometimes cause problems. Sometimes they don't. I have one that some boards will boot on it and some won't. I think it's down to the timing that's on the chips. So the first thing I did is I popped that out and I put a known working good Commodore PLA. Just to roll that out of the way. I swapped it out. Gone. So I then sort of started getting a little bit coming on screen. I don't know whether it were coincident or not, because I put the gals back in later and the gal seems to work fine anyway. So I put the dead test cartridge in and it gave me flash, three flashes. And when you look at the dead test cartridge manual, it shows that this revision of board, which is a 407 Rev B, points to um, U11 RAM chip, which is this one just here. So first thing I did there is desolder the chip out of the board. I put a socket in there and I put a good known RAM chip into that socket. In fact, Michael actually sent me two good RAM chips. So there's still one there, Michael. So that, that one will come back to you. And after I did that, it then come on with a really, really strange screen. One that I've not come across before. So I put a picture up and you can have a look at that and that's what this kind of screen that I was getting from from it. If I put a cartridge in, um, pretty much any cartridge really, they all fired up and worked all okay. The dead test cartridge came up as you can see it on the screen now. Really nice and clean and good colours and good letterings and etc. But when I put any other Diag cartridge in or any other sort of made dead test cartridge it just come up with a load of gabble so as you can see there i've piggybacked the u11 ram chip and we have got something on screen even though all the letters and the wordings and the characters are all out of sync they just don't look right at all so i do suspect that there's another ram chip at fault there so what i'm going to do now is take that ram chip out fit a socket in there and we'll change that RAM chip and then we'll come back and have a look with the new RAM chip in there on its own because what it might be is yeah okay we've piggybacked 
he might be getting a correct signal enough now to be able to go out and, and boot um, but it's also sending incorrect signals elsewhere hence why the characters and things like that are all uh, skew with um, it could also be down to um, a bad character ROM, a bad kernel ROM but we're going to cross that bridge um, when we get to it so I went onto this website which is the pictorial site for the Commodore 64 fault screens and I came across a picture on there that looked very very similar to what we had so that was telling me it was U25 which is one of the multi multiplexer chips um, that, which control all the RAM there's one at the bottom one at the one just above it as well so I thought right we'll take that out so I took that out um, run a test in maybe EEPROM programmer which will, which will pop up now so as you can see from that it passed strange so I thought well okay let's move on let's change the one above it we'll change that one as well because the one they are quite known for failing in them two chips so I changed them no effect put it in the EEPROMer programmer and it passed so that was that so I was still struggling I couldn't think what to do there so I, I had another look um, and one of the other pictorial pictures again said that um, if that garble screen was there I mean you could still type and it could still respond with stuff um, i.e. if you press run stop and restore you could see it actually put the kind of letters up that showed you the load press play on tape sure enough, if I press play on tape, the screen went blue and it went into load. Um, at this point, when I had the cartridge playing, all the graphics seemed to be all okay and everything in the cartridge. So, here we are. We've got a dead test cartridge that's passing everything. And we've got garbled lettering on the main display. So I looked in it a bit, a bit deeper and I thought, well, I'll swap the kernel out. So, so I changed that one first, and then I swapped the kernel out, and still didn't make any difference. So I swapped the character ROM out, still didn't make any difference. I found a continuity error on the back of the board, so I've had to put some jumper wires across the back of the board. Still exactly the same, didn't make a difference to it. I changed the VIC chip. What I could see though, when I used the other dead test cartridge, is bottom left corner if you look on that screen there, You've got U19, U18, U17. Uh, U17 is your PLA chip, U18 is your SID chip, and U19 is your VIC chip. So it's telling me that there's a fault with all three of them chips. And I kind of didn't believe that I could have a fault with all three of them chips, to be honest, just like that. So the only other thing that sort of controls that area is all the logic array around the bottom down here which is right next to them two chips that we've already replaced. Decided to pull out U26, which was right next to that um, one that we changed the two. Right next to it, right at the side of it. So I pulled that out and popped that into the EEPROM programmer and run a test on that. It failed, as you can see in this little clip. And that's come up on logic test. One and two is okay. So test three, four has got an error. Five, six, seven, eight is all normal. So that pulls up with that chip on U26, which is the logic chip, which is what's been throwing us around um, and changing all these other types of chips out. Um, so you should always remember it's not always the RAM. Um, it could quite potentially be um, originally that the RAM chip that we replaced is okay. So what I'll do is when I go over back over to the Commodore 64, I'll swap that over and test it back to see whether it's okay and to see whether it was just U26 so there you go so put the other one back in and it passed your spare one so I popped a socket into it and put this good chip in which is an LS373 and hey presto it's all back up and running so I've had it sat there running for a while now we're up to count 42 and it's passing everything on the on the harness. 
this is the test that I was running where I could see in the bottom left corner where U19, 18, 17 is, where it were all garbled, but I could see it had red writing bad at the sides of it. I had them other, other ones up at the top on the user ports and stuff like that, but that's irrespective to the moment when we were trying to repair what we're doing originally. So I really don't want to leave this ceramic chip, Vic chip, without a heat shield anymore. So I'm going to put a heat shield on there, which I'll leave that on there for you, Michael. You don't have to take that back, send that back or anything. So I've put the shield back on there now and that I can keep that chip nice and cool. He sent me them two ROM chips through. He also sent me his SID through, which is this one with the white with the yellow dot on it. And he also sent me his original PLA because the GAL one was already on the board. So I'm taking the GAL one out because I prefer to have things original and we may as well just leave it as is. If you get this back, Michael, um, and you find that it, it's not booting again, it might be that that GAL with it having turn pin on the bottom of it and not flat pins it might have just spread that PLA socket a little bit so if you, you get it back and it still doesn't sort of come on it's got a quite a long way to go so it's going back over to Ireland and I'm here in in the UK so as I said Michael if you get it back and it, and it doesn't work properly um, just pop that PLA chip back out and put your gals back in um, you, you'll probably find it'll be all okay then I do find that when you put these gals in, because they are turn pin, like I said, the, the pins are fatter, so it tends to stretch the socket a little bit, which makes it looser for the original ones. So it might be a case that it pops back up, but, but it should be all okay. So rundown, what have we done? We tested it with dead test cartridges. We tested it with the games cartridges. We got the dead test working eventually with three flashes and changed the memory at U11. Uh, Resocketed both the multiplexer chips at the side, um, tested the multiplexers in the EEPROM programmer, perfectly fine. I moved and I changed the kernel and the character. And the other one at the back, I found them traces at the back of them too. So I've repaired them traces. So we've had one, two sockets, three, four, five, six sockets replaced. I've adjusted the trim for the VIC chip at the side, deoxide the variable adjuster at the side, just to make sure that it wasn't that that was giving us some issues. And yeah, that's it. So what I want to quickly do for you now is I'm, I'm just going to test and, and show you, Michael, what that sound chip's doing. Okay, so I'm just going to set these little sock chips to one side, what you've set, got you've sent me. I'm just going to pull the board a little bit further forward. Let me switch it off. No, I won't just yet, it's alright. So if I turn the volume up on the TV, you should be able to hear my SID singing. It'll take a little bit of while to come round, I might just skip it to that bit for you. There we go, it's going to drop down now, the SID test is going to kick in and you'll hear my SID. So there you go, I'm just going to switch that off now. Just while I'm swapping that round, I don't know whether you heard on the sound, but every time the sound changes with my SID in there, it pops. You go, pop, pop, right at the very end of each sound. This SID is a little bit faulty, but at least it does work, kind of use it for test machines. So I'm just going to pop your SID back in there now, just to show you what that does. So already I can hear a buzzing noise on the TV that's getting louder and louder and louder. I don't know whether you can make that out or not. I'll try and increase the volume on the... There you go, did you, yeah. did you hear that? Yep. So it's just getting more higher and higher and higher pitched if you can hear that. So we're almost down to the point where it's going to run tests on the SID. Almost there. Just go through these parts. 
Bang. So it comes up with U18 as a bad SID chip. It also disables your controller port. I don't know if you can hear that. But it was making all sorts of noises. Just try and move the microphone so you can pick that up when it gets around there again. Going to SID test now. Yep, you heard that, didn't you? I'm, hope, I'm sure you heard that. It's all over the place. So, Michael, I'll have a chat to you about that, see what you want to do about the SID. So I'm just going to knock that back off and put my SID back in for the minute. And you, just, you will hear the sound completely change. Oh, I'm just going to flick that back on now. You should hear the TV not buzzing as much. It will do because I've put it on full volume. And then you'll hear the difference as it's going through the test. Wow. So the volume on the monitor is absolutely at max. So I'll skip this bit through now, straight through to the SID test. And just listen, and you'll hear that pop, pop at the end of um, each note change. Yeah, that popping. So you can see as soon as you change that SID, everything's perfect again. So there you go. All I've done now is swap back the U11 memory chip, and that's what we've got. So I'm just going to swap that back out again now. So to summarise, we've reseated the kernel, and we've reseated the character ROM. Um, I've reseated both the logic chips, the multiplex chips, at u25 and u13 tested them they wasn't they was were coming back and responding as good we swapped out the u11 ram chip you can see my hand from there u11 ram chip and we've swapped out the 74 ls373 that resides in u26 and that's brought us board back up and running so I'm going to just going to put it back in its case now, put it all back together. I'm going to take my SID chips and my PLAs back out of this unit and put his original ones back in and then we'll come back um, and we'll have a test of this board just to make sure that it's all working all okay. Do a bit of Donkey Kong at Virgin's Digital Basement. The mount disc, fast load. Shouldn't take too long, hopefully. I'll skip as forward as it does take a while, but oh no, we're done, look. That's the beauty of uh, Gideon's ultimate cartridge. We're decrunching. Come on any second. Adrian Digital. Kind of shows you what's going on there. You can see the sounds kicking away there, nice. So you can see now it uh, sounds really nice on there. Bit of Adrian's digital basement. <laughs> so I'm just going to try something else now, right quickly. See if it makes a difference. I know I've done this last in the last video, but it just it just shows it so quick.
I'm going to see how quickly that just deals with stuff. Gideon's ultimate cartridge. It's absolutely fantastic. I'll just put the joystick in now. Well, bear with me. We'll open it in that one. Yep. Let's see if I can do this. A bit of Super Mario's. Never thought you'd be playing Super Mario on a Commodore 64. <laughs> Died at first stage. A true retro gamer. I think this joystick is sticking to be fair. Let's have a look at it when it first starts. Yeah, left. Right, it's okay. Moves every time. Look, go left, 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 left. Go, 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 go. go. Yeah. It looks like I'm gonna have to strip down the joystick and fix that as well. It's just to show you that everything's working there, Michael. I'll just try another game up. I think this one takes a little bit longer to load, but I'm not sure. We'll see. Nope, we've done. We're decrunching. So this is Man Cave by Cytronics. We'll just skip past that part. The crunchy game now. And that's Man Cave. You recognise that music. Sounds a lot like men behaving badly, doesn't it, to be fair? So I'll say that's another fix. Um, I'll give you a call, Michael. And have a chat to you about getting this back to you. Um, thank you again for watching another episode of 8-Bit Retro Refix. Bye.